Okay, what I'm about to show you is a very common clinical scenario. Uh, you have a patient who comes in with a solid class one posterior occlusion bilaterally. But you notice that one arch, in this case, the lower, has more crowding than the upper. So there's a little bit of crowding here, but if I told you to look quickly and I say, which arch looks better? I think you say, this looks better than this. Now, you don't necessarily have to recognize this kind of disparity right off the bat, but whenever you have a case that's a class one normal jaw structure and one arch is more crowded than the other, there's a little bit of a challenge that's going to unfold. And this is where proper diagnosis is critical. And so let me explain. The lower teeth, in order for these teeth to get straight, they need to be moved into a broader, wider arc. But if you do that on the upper, you have to do that on the lower. If you do that on the lower, you have to do that on the upper as well, because the patient already has a solid bite. So if you notice, the arches are expanding upper and lower. When you do this, the lower expansion is required to create room, in part, to moving the teeth into a broader arc, and then they become straight. But since the upper does not have as much crowding, when you expand it to that same extent as what was required on the lower, you end up with some small spaces between the teeth. And that is something you're faced with, and you have to explain this to the patient. Now, this patient may not want those spaces. The reason why the patient does have the space, as I explained about the broadening of the arch, but the inherent latent issue that you can find if you're doing Invisalign in this Bolton analysis, which has been around for years before Invisalign. But basically, if you look, this patient has a tremendous mandibular excess. You could call it a maxillary deficiency. And what this means is that the collective width of the lower teeth are wider than the commensurate width of the average upper tooth width. Basically, it has to do, in this case, as in many cases, with the upper lateral incisors. They're not even six millimeters. The normal average width would be about seven, maybe 7.5. The central incisors are close to normal. And so when you do this case, you can either expand the arches and reveal the narrowness of these teeth and then restore them afterwards, or to minimize that space, you do interproximal reduction on the lower. In this case, I've already done some and I still have this space. Now, I sometimes say to a patient who may not be expecting either having space on the top at the end of the treatment or any interproximal reduction, I say, you kind of have to pick your poison. Uh, and, and what I mean by that is if the patient says, hey, there's no way I want gaps between my upper teeth, we have to do more filing on the bottom. If a patient says, there's no way I'm letting you file my teeth and I'm not doing interproximal reduction, then you have to broaden the upper more and you'll have more space on the top. So there's sort of an inverse uh, proportion between the amount of the IPR and the amount of space that would be created on the top. And so it's a complex issue to explain, uh, but basically uh, when uh, a doctor says with Invisalign that they have to do interproximal reduction, quite often it's to balance out this kind of uh, an issue. And by the way, if you did Invisalign or a clear aligner treatment with something less sophisticated, certainly with the now defunct Smile Direct, they would not have opened up this space on the top and you could not have filing on the bottom. And you might be thinking, right, yeah, so how do the teeth get straight? Well, what would happen is the lower arch would expand and the teeth would come out beyond the upper teeth or the patient's jaw to avoid that would adapt and that could definitely lead to TMJ problems. So this is a complicated explanation for a complicated issue, the Bolton discrepancy.